this week on Forward. Listen, I, I have nothing against Joe personally, and I will vote for him if Trump is the nominee, but I would love to see someone new come along from either party. I think our parties are broken, and we can see from polling that most people agree. Of the, you know, thousands of Republican voters that braved the cold, 40% chose someone else. And that's meaningful um, unless that number remains split between two people. It is my genuine pleasure to welcome to the podcast political commentator for CNN and columnist just about everywhere. You might know her from Bill Maher, S.E. Cup. Welcome, S.E. Thanks for having me. So nice to be here. Yeah, such a pleasure. So uh, I was thinking who could talk sense about American politics to folks, let people know how they should be interacting with the, with the news. And you were the who top of the list. Who is that person? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it, indeed, indeed. So this conversation is happening after the Iowa caucus and right before New Hampshire votes. It's going to be super timely. So what was your reaction to uh, the results in Iowa? I had a few. Um First and foremost, I was eager to see whether the polls were under indexing Trump or over indexing him. And, you know, turns out they were about right. Um, again, that's a snapshot in time. That's not a prescription or, or, you know, looking, looking down the road, but I was interested and they were right about Trump's commanding lead in Iowa. He's very popular there. However, of the, you know, thousands of, Republican voters that braved the cold to go and caucus that night, 40% chose someone else. And that's meaningful um, unless that number remains split between two people, then it's meaningless. But it's meaningful that 40% of Republicans in Iowa, this very red MAGA state, very evangelical state, chose someone else. So what that says to me is going forward, there is an opportunity for a Trump alternative to emerge if they can kind of get out of each other's way. I, I don't think that person will emerge if Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis keep splitting the vote. Hey, Essie, I'm going to tell you a funny story from four years ago. Check it out. So I'm running for president in Iowa. And then someone interviews me and is like, hey, you're at 5% of the polls. And then uh, uh, I respond, oh, polls, schmoles. They're undercounting all of the enthusiasm that we're seeing. A lot of our people are going to be new. And, and then we got 5%. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were right on. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, that Alan Seltzer poll in Iowa is very, very accurate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, right. and, and was pretty much spot on. New Hampshire is a different story. I have to say that the polling in New Hampshire is dicier, in my mm -hmm. opinion, because a significant part of the electorate, let's call it 36%, is independent. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it's not insane to target registered Republicans and Democrats, but it's a little trickier just to, to target independents who can opt for one primary or the other. And as an example of what I'm, I mean, about 110,000 Republicans caucused in Iowa last week, uh, and it's a state of 3 million. So you're talking about fewer than 4% of Iowans showed up for this thing. Right. And by the way, when I ran for president as a Democrat last time, uh, my win number was about 40,000 was the thought, uh, which is about what the winner got. I think they, like Bernie might have gotten 41,000 or something like that. So we're talking about relatively modest numbers. Uh, if you just walked into an Iowa diner, um, the number of people that were actually going to caucus, probably pretty low. <laughs> you just like walked yeah. into a random place. But then if you walk to a uh, convening of party activists, then the density is higher. Now, New Hampshire, it's easier because it's a primary. People can roll out of bed and vote. And, and so the total number of, uh, of votes in New Hampshire will be in the multiple hundreds of thousands. And, and the conventional wisdom is that the uh, the independents are going to pile in to the Republican primary and vote for a Nikki Haley. Uh, that that's the big theory of the case. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, that's certainly her hope. And look, I know New Hampshire really well. I grew up in Massachusetts, went to school right on the border. I know 
New Hampshire voters. And they're weird. I mean that in a very, you know, positive way. They're very independent. They don't like to be told who to vote for. They like to wait to the last minute. And as you said, it's a primary, so they can do it any, you know, any time of the day. It doesn't take five hours like a caucus can. And so you don't know until you know, and you have that exit polling in terms of knowing why. But yeah, I can see Nikki Haley doing very well in New Hampshire. I can also see Donald Trump doing very well. I was just up there a couple weeks ago for um, a family event, and there were loads of Trump signs. Uh, again, a snapshot in time. And certainly anecdotal I'm, I'm, evidence. I'm pretty sure those signs are still up. <laughs> they're, they're still there. And, and yeah, I mean, it's there are pockets of New Hampshire, big pockets, um, that are Trump country. And so I, I'm not sure she can beat him there, but I think she'll have a very good showing. I know it's not Ron DeSantis country. It really isn't. Um, so I don't think he's going to do well there, and he doesn't either. Hey, I've got a, a quick um, insidery question for you. So you're on TV all the time. You can ask your opinion. Um, and there's what you think will happen and what you want to happen. I'll give yeah. you an example from myself right now. Uh, I think Trump's rolling through this process, uh, and is going to wind up the Republican nominee very quickly, maybe even as soon as uh, February or even, you know, earlier, <laughs> it's, it's very possible. Yeah. Um, now I don't like that outcome. So if someone sticks a camera on me and is like, what, what are you going to do? Then, you know, I say, Oh, like Nikki Haley has a path as a shot. And then I make a case sometimes, um, yeah. if, you know, because, you know, like I clearly don't want to just concede in this case, like a bad outcome. Um, does that happen to you? <laughs> on yeah. Lot? yeah, because, Listen, you have to be honest about the fact that the media plays a role in this. And, you know, we saw that caucus night when multiple networks, including my own, called it before the votes were even cast in some cases. So when you're asked on television, um, you have an opportunity to kind of, you know, it's I I'm opinion, so I get to do this. Reporters should not do this, but I'm an opinion commentator. You have fortunate. an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine me trying to keep this shut. Um, so, you know, I have the opportunity to say, look, I think Nikki Haley has a pathway. And I believe that. But I, like you, also believe Trump feels very inevitable. And when I'm talking to friends and family off camera, I say, I think he's got the nomination locked up. But you have a role to play in the political conversation. And, you know, it isn't a lie. It isn't even a wish. It's. I'm going to stand up for a person that I think would be better than Trump and and could get there. And if other people are persuaded by that argument because I lay out all the whys and all the uh, the reasons why she should, that can have an impact. And that's why that's why we're hired. Um, you know, opinion folks on all sides of the political spectrum are hired to do just that to to persuade, to change minds, to provoke thought. That's that's our job. What a fun job you have, Essie, <laughs> to try and push people or persuade people in a, a certain direction. I mean, it is, except you feel like, especially in this political climate, I'm sure you feel this way too, that you're screaming into, an, into a, a void, into a vacuum, because, you know, I've been screaming about Trump since 2015 and how terrible yeah. he will be for the Republican Party and not only did, you know, my party's voters ignore me, but people I thought were much more principled inside the party also ignored <laughs> everything we were saying. So that's not fun. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. When you go to the bathroom, you always close the door behind you because you don't want random people seeing what you're doing. But when you go online, people sometimes can see what you're doing. I'm talking about those big tech companies and other folks who might not have your best interest at heart. That's why I use ExpressVPN and you should too. This way, your data stays yours. It can't be sold and resold. When I use ExpressVPN, you just click one button, transports you to another server, and also give you access to fun content that might be available in another country. It's like you're a global traveler without 
ever leaving your home. Get an extra three months of ExpressVPN free by going to expressvpn.com slash yang. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN dot com slash yang for three extra months free. ExpressVPN.com slash yang. Yeah, and, and there's really no excuse this time. Like the first time you'd be like, oh, you know, like maybe he'll uh, uh, outperform. And then now this time it's like, whoa, you kind of know what you're getting. So uh, a- a- anyone who is on board this time um, or really is on the wrong side of history. So here's a, another example of get asked, think something, wish for the other. Um, looking at the numbers, I think Trump beats Biden in the general if it's held today. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and just some basic numbers out there. Uh, Joe Biden's walking around with a 38% approval rating. Uh, he's going to be 82 at the end of this year. He's down in um, five of the six swing states, and uh, according to recent polling, including by eight in Michigan, yeah. which he won, eight in Georgia, which he won, right. uh, nine in North Carolina, which they're hoping to contest, and he only lost by one last time. Um, so it's like that the numbers have all moved <laughs> yeah. to, to the wrong direction by eight. Uh, yeah. and, and they spent $25 million trying to boost his numbers in the swing states on an ad campaign about Bidenomics was a total bust. Uh, and so I look at this and be like, guys, this is um, this is bad. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, if it came down to it, I think anyone would guess, you know, I would vastly prefer Biden to Trump. And yeah. so if you wind up in this situation where, you know, like I'm having to uh, try and get people to, to vote in a particular direction, you know, I, I would uh, pick Biden 100 times out of 100. Um, yeah. But uh, but I think Biden is heading towards an L if we wind up with that general election matchup. I completely agree. And it's very frustrating because when I talk to Biden folks and other Democrats, it's almost like fingers in the ears, like they don't want to hear it. And they're really convinced. Yeah, that um, that. That Faustian bargain is what it's going to come down to. Well, if I have to choose, I'm going to choose Biden. But I I think that's very dangerous. And honestly, I think they're counting on they're counting on Roe, which was really effective in the midterms. And they're not wrong to do that. They're counting on the democracy argument, which was also effective in the midterms. They're not wrong to do that. But what they're undervaluing is what's happening on the border and the way people feel about the economy. And, you know, telling people what they feel is wrong is a very bad idea in politics. And the border stuff is really bad. And I wrote a kind of whimsical column a a week or so ago that if Biden wanted to turn all of this around and shake things up, he should close the border. He should call an emer- a state of emergency at the border, close it. Republicans would freak out because he's taking away their number one talking point. Democrats would freak out because obviously they want the border open. And it would force Congress to finally come to the table and figure it out. Um, I-, I think that could actually really jolt his campaign. Now, I know he won't do that, but the border stuff is really leading a lot of the political um, angst. And it's what drove Iowa caucus goers to Trump. I mean, we have that exit polling. Immigration was the number one issue for them. They are not on the border, but they are feeling it because when you live in a state like New York and they're moving your kids out of public school to put migrants in on a cold day, well, this affects you as a family. And you think, why? This isn't fair. This isn't working. Even with the compassion for everyone involved, this isn't working. And so I think that's going to be their biggest um, albatross. If if Biden loses, it will be because of the border. You know, some of the recent polling as he has Biden losing among Latinos to Trump. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, things that uh, d- Democrats um, wouldn't uh, envision. And one of the frustrating things when I also talk to Democrats who also have that kind of like head in the sand or like, you know, fingers in the ears approach is like, look, it's not what you think. It's not what I think. It's what 100,000 swing voters in Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, Georgia, um, Wisconsin think. 
a lot of them are not college grads. And one of the the things I saw in a focus group run by a, a friend of uh, ours, Sarah Longwell, um, where there, there was someone who voted for Biden who says he's going to vote for Trump this time and says, I'm just going to ignore the news and enjoy the economy. Uh, where like if you go to the the, the, the person it'd be like, wow. but but democracy is on the line. He's like, yeah, Look, I, like, I don't I don't care about your democracy. I'm just going to turn off the talking heads and just like in, enjoy my. Uh, you know, pr- like presumably like lower inflation, better numbers, et, et, et cetera. I mean, yeah. you only need uh, 50,000 folks uh, uh, wh- who make a similar rationalization in your mind and Trump wins. Yes. That's a really interesting quote. And I'll probably, I will probably quote it at some point because that's, I mean, that is it. And the democracy argument it matters to us, but we have the luxury of caring about democracy, right? I'm sitting here, very nice house in Connecticut, right? I'm in my I'm in my home studio. My kids at a great school. I'm not worried about crime. I'm not worried about opioids in my town. I'm not worried about illegal immigration running through my town. I, I'm lucky. I can care about democracy. If you're someone who's living in a big city or a rural town that's ravaged by drugs or or crime or illegal immigrants that you think are taking your jobs or your, you know, your resources. You don't care about, you don't care about democracy. democracy. You care about your yeah, gas yeah. prices. You care about your yeah. food prices. You care about the job that you haven't gotten a raise at in five years. So you have to connect with voters on all of these metrics. And I think the there's a real blind spot for, for Biden on the economy and, and immigration. He's just not making that connection with a lot of people. Oh yeah. He's um, behind Trump by 25 points on the economy among independents. I mean, you know, you know like, I mean, like you see numbers like that and you're like, okay guys, I think I see what your problem is going to be. Yeah. How are you going to get healthier this year? One way to do so is to have healthy, chef-crafted meals delivered to your door stress-free. What the heck am I talking about? Factor. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon to a healthier, happier you. I've been eating Factor for this last number of weeks, and wow, it's been a game-changer. We're talking about delicious chicken taco bowl, spicy poblano beef, and every time I'm like, ooh, This is going to be tasty, and it is. makes you feel good. It's cost-efficient. It's flexible. No prep. No mess. You can't screw it up. Just poke a couple holes in it, heat it up, and it's fresh, never frozen. I got to say, if you try Factor, you are going to be pumped. It's going to make you healthier, happier, more productive in the new year. Head to factormeals.com slash yang50 and use code yang50 to get 50% off. That's code YANG50 at factormeals.com slash YANG50 to get 50% off. Factor! By the time this conversation airs, I will have endorsed a guy named Dean Phillips who's running uh, okay. for president against uh, Joe Biden. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm going to be in New Hampshire. It's going to be good fun. Uh, and, and here's the Dean Phillips theory of the case. So Dean Phillips is third term member of Congress from a purple district in Minnesota. So he's like a pretty reasonable guy. Uh, And then he looks up and is like, hey, guys, I think Joe's going to lose. And we should probably do something about that. Uh, Polling shows that a generic Democrat defeats Trump by six or eight points uh, where where Biden loses by, let's call it three or four. Uh, uh, And so that's like a nine or 10 point swing. Uh, You know, Joe Biden said himself, there are 50 Democrats who could defeat Donald Trump. Why not just upgrade the nominee to someone who's a, a sub-octogenarian? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and by the way, the same thing works in reverse, too. Like if Nikki Haley were to become the Republican nominee, I think she cleans Joe Biden's clock, you know, by yeah. whatever. I mean, there was one poll that had it like 17. It might not be that gargantuan, but I think it yeah. would be a very clean win. Um, and the Democrats still have every opportunity to uh, similarly upgrade their nominee. Now, uh, in New Hampshire, and most people think, well, this thing's baked because, you know, Joe's got it in the bag. But you know what's going on in New Hampshire, where 
Joe's not on the ballot because they're punishing New Hampshire for going out of order. So you have Dean Phillips, who polling shows that 28 percent um, up from zero, uh, you know, 10 weeks ago. So he's rising fast. Uh, just like a lot of other states, New Hampshire Democrats are also kind of uneasy about uh, Joe and his age. Uh, Joe actually has done poorly there three out of three times. And so if Dean Phillips puts up a big number, anything starting with a three handle, for example, uh, it, it would be, uh, uh, any, I mean, yeah. like 20% plus is like a rebuke. Like 30% plus would be like, you know, an equivalent of like throwing the table over uh, yeah. on uh, on an, an incumbent president. And then the party would have to look at it and say, wait a minute, uh, like, you know, what what just happened? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Dean would have this huge head of steam and there'd be a, a genuine contest where people would draw some of the same conclusions I just outlined. Um, so that's the Dean Phillips theory of the case. And I will say also the Andrew Yang theory of the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, what are your thoughts on the, the Dean Phillips effort? Well, let me start ecumenically and say I've I've been telling Democrats who would listen for years that they need to build a, a younger bench. And that was true in Congress. I was supportive of Tim Ryan's effort to to sort of, you know, push Nancy Pelosi aside and, and get some younger blood into Democratic leadership, because not only is it necessary inside the party, but then you grow a bench and you condition Democratic voters to see new people. They haven't seen a new face in forever, you know, not since Barack Obama came along. And, and, you know, they, they really just like to keep putting the same people into these positions. So ecumenically, I love this. I love wait, wait, these wait, wait, younger... Essie, wait, let's summarize. Barack, Hillary, Joe, yeah. Joe. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And listen, before Trump, we did the same thing. We decided who was going to be the next nominee at the last election, right? Like whose turn was it? Who came in second? We'll put them up. And so we didn't, you know, we didn't give voters a a, a, a chance to, um, you know, find new talent really either. So that's, that's ecumenically. I love this um, I, idea. You know, practically... It's a long shot. I'm sure you know this. And and um, I'm sure I haven't met Dean Phillips. I, I, I might have. I might have interviewed him at some point. Um, he seems lovely and really smart. And I, I, I like his brand of, of politics. And I think he could do well in New Hampshire. But it's really hard to go against an incumbent. You know this. Um, because you have the full weight and resources of the DNC or the RNC behind you. It's just really hard to sort of jostle that you know, infrastructure loose and cut through it. But listen, I, I have nothing against Joe personally, and I will vote for him if Trump is the nominee, but I would love to see someone new come along from either party. I think our parties are broken and we can see from polling that most people agree. About 65% of Americans do not feel aligned with either of the two parties. And that's because they're in the middle on almost every issue. The parties like to talk in extremes. And so you can feel very unrepresented if you are in the middle, in fact, the majority uh, on lots of issues from abortion to immigration to guns to climate. If you're in the middle, you feel orphaned by your party because you're not pure enough. You're not, you're not, you know, loyal enough. Um, that's very, I think, um, disorienting for a lot of voters. And they're deeply, deeply disillusioned with our two parties, and they don't want either of these guys. They don't want to make this choice. Yeah, the Biden-Trump rematch is unappealing to three out of four Americans or something ridiculous. Oh. Uh, and, and it really puts the dysfunction of the parties in stark relief. Uh, I'm with you on trying to upgrade generationally. Um, I, I also agree, you know, the party um, has it out for you. Uh, it's tough. Um, so with, with Dean's campaign, let's say he puts up a big number in New Hampshire yeah. Uh, and then the press looks at it and is like, wow, like that, that, cause I think even people who are very deeply in the know would be shocked and stunned if Dean put up 25% or whatever the number is. Uh, uh, and then, uh, the question is whether you get a genuine horse race dynamic. Um, South Carolina happens, um, 10 days later, it'd be tough. Um, but Michigan, Michigan is at the end of February and that could be a real contest, especially because there's a lot of discontent with Joe 
uh, in Michigan yeah. uh, in in various quarters. But do you worry that let's say he does well in New Hampshire? Do you worry that Biden and plenty of folks in the media will just say, "Well, Biden wasn't there; he wasn't on the ballot"? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to try and minimize the impact of the loss yeah. for sure. Um, but you are looking at an environment where the incumbent president traditionally will get, uh, you know, 85, 90 percent um, with zero effort at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and you also have an historical precedent of I think it was Hubert Humphrey challenging uh, LBJ and getting 42 percent in New Hampshire. And then LBJ said, I'm out <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. afterwards. Um, so there's this whole range. I mean, gosh, if Dean were to get 42 uh, percent, everyone would look at that and say, I mean, like, like this is a repudiation of the yeah. Biden plan. Um, and, and I do think the Biden plan is a terrible plan. I think that the, as in the running Biden, I don't, I'm not talking about a specific policy. I'm talking the Biden plan to run for reelection a second time. I mean, if he were to do a George Washington and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm out. Uh, time to pass the torch to the next generation. He would go down in the books as one of the greats. Dean's yeah. Trump gets a, a lot of uh, great things done, is a voice of reason on the world stage, and then steps aside with the next generation. That's like, check, yeah. check, check. As it is, instead, it's going to be overstay welcome, uh, in, like serve the country back to Trump uh, you know, on a platter, um, a, and then bemoan the end of democracy. I mean, that's where we're heading, in, in my estimation. He's sort of Brett Farving it, right? I mean, he, overstaying a little bit too much for that last season with the Jets, which didn't really work out. Um, and this was so unnecessary because he was elected to be a transitional. He even president. called himself, I'm going to be a bridge to the next generation. That's and right. my, my joke, as he was like, That's right. bridge to the next generation is not cling to office until you expire at the age of 86. I mean, that's nuts. Exactly. And... Yeah, the, the, there should be no embarrassment among Democrats that they want to move on from Joe Biden. The idea was him for him to get out, get Trump out, get some sanity restored, which he did. Check, check, check. And then, yeah, leave it to the next Democrat in line of, of your choosing, right? So there should be no embarrassment about that. But they are so unwilling to admit that it's, it's time to go and move on. They won't do it. They can't do it. And it might end up, you know, handing the country back over to Trump. Hey, YouTube, thanks for watching. Please do hit like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified every time a new episode drops, probably on Mondays, but hit that bell and thank you. So you know how I have beef with I have beef with a lot of people, um, but but, uh, but but I I I I have beef with Gavin Newsom, Gretchen Whitmer, J.B. Pritzker, and all the campaigns in waiting who were told sit this one out and wait till twenty eight. I mean, if Trump wins, what the heck does twenty eight even look like? You know right. what I mean? I feel like those characters are missing their moment. Like this is their moment. The country needs them. They should run. Yeah. Uh, and if they ran, then I think uh, even Joe and Jamie wouldn't be able to hold back a real, a real competition. Well, those are recognizable names, you know, and again, no offense to Dean, like they're more recognizable than Dean. They're just, you know, these are governors. And so they've, I, I think, had a bit more exposure. Um, and so, yeah, I think they would have been well positioned, but you don't cut in line over there. And, you know, that was true of Pelosi you know, Steny Hoyer has been waiting for that job for a long time, bless his heart. Um, and you just, you don't, you don't, um, you don't cut the line. And it's seen as, you know, ungrateful or or whatever it is. But for the all the Seth Moltons and the Eric Swalwells and the Tim Ryans, young Democrats that I really like, that I think are charismatic, talented, thoughtful, smart, kind, decent, you, there's a, a a bunch of great options over on the left, and it's like they're trying to shoot themselves in the foot with this. It's it's a bit it's a bit of a cannibalism kind of mentality over there. It's not good for the party. It's definitely not good for the country. Yeah, I, I call it conformity and careerism, where everyone's just like, mm -hmm. "Yeah, I'll stay in line because if I, I stand up and be like, hey guys, 
Joe's old, it's born, you know, born at 42 or whatever, then, then you'll be pilloried. By the way, that's how the entire Dean Phillips campaign started is that he raised his hand and said, I don't, I don't think Joe should run again. And then everyone um, attacked him in the press. He's like, you guys just said the same thing to me in private. What the heck is going on? <laughs> right. you, all, you all agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, that, uh, but, and then Dean tried to recruit uh, Gavin Newsom, Gretchen Whitmer, and J.B. Pritzker. And uh, they wouldn't take his call. And and he jokingly said, he's like, they would take my call under any other circumstances. But when I was calling to talk about this, they were like, oh, unavailable, unavailable. And and Dean's, you know, like vice chair of the party, again, third term member of Congress, flipped a, a, a purple district. Like, I mean, he's like a dude. You know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, the fact that they were like, you know. Cannot can, cannot uh, even take a call. It was is can't be seen to, to talking to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really yeah, it's that's... a shame. It's a shame. But again, there's I think a lot of myopia in in politics, but especially in the Democratic Party. Like we've got there's this protectionism going on for you know the the old guard. It's really um, it's counterproductive, and I think that's going to play out big time this year. Well, hey, if, if I'm right that Dean ends up uh, catalyzing uh, a real primary, um, it sounds like you and I would be happy about it. Um, yeah. Do you, do you have any guidance for people who are watching the news as to um, what they should be trying to keep an eye out for on Tuesday, uh, the night of the New Hampshire primaries? Well, I think the the margin between Trump and Nikki is going to be the story. I mean, if she beats him, that's huge momentum for her going into South Carolina. And it really pierces the inevitability idea that that he's pushing and that you and I agree it probably is real. Yeah. Um, you know, if she can win in a, in a state, she can beat him somewhere, then that argument kind of slips away a little bit and maybe only temporarily, but it slips away a little bit. So That'll be a huge story if she, if she wins. Um, if she comes in second, whether it's close or not, I, I think, like you said, he's going to wrap it up real quick, probably even uh, more quickly than a lot of people are imagining, probably before Super Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's even some speculation that uh, Nikki uh, might not want to bring it to South Carolina, where she's theoretically uh, strong because she was the governor there, but uh, that electorate's actually not as good a fit for her versus yeah. Trump as New Hampshire, which has like a higher education level, higher independent level. The governor yes. is a never Trump Republican. Like if she doesn't beat him in New Hampshire, it's hard to see another state that's uh, a better opportunity. That's exactly what it is. And I've been saying this is the, the battle between Nikki and Ron DeSantis is a battle between money and map. Um, Ron's running out of money. He's actually better positioned in states down the road than Nikki Haley is for the reasons you just said, um, where there are fewer moderates and independents. But can he last till those states come up with, with, you know, his dwindling funds? Can he convince donors to keep giving him money to get that far? Her problem is the map. You know, she does real well up front, but beyond New Hampshire and South Carolina, it gets real tough for her. So it's this, how far can one go and how long can the other go is the sort of the, the crisis that they're facing. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. It's a new year, time to make yourself better rested, more energized, and a great way to do that is with a Helix Sleep mattress. I took their quiz and I said, you know what? I roll around a lot, I sleep in my back, I need a lot of support, and I got matched with a Dawn Lux mattress that has become a game changer, not just for me, but for my kids. It's their favorite mattress, even though it wasn't designed for them. Helix will now actually tailor mattresses specifically for big and tall customers and for kids. They have a 100-night trial. You can try the mattress for three months, send it back, and a 10 to 15 year warranty. It's the top rated mattress by Wired and many other publications. Don't take my word for it. Try it out for yourself. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and use code helixpartner20. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now.
And on the Democratic side, what kind of number do you think Dean has to put up for uh, pundits to be like, whoa, like I uh, didn't see that coming. This might be a thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. 30s, 30s would be an undeniable kind of shock, right? And you'd have to, if you're a Democrat, you'd have to look at that pretty seriously. Again, I think folks are going to say, well, but Biden wasn't there. But that's a that would be a huge number because they don't have to go and 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 vote for anyone. They don't have to go and vote for Dean Phillips, uh, you know, just because Biden's off the ballot. They could stay home. They could also vote in the Republican primary. Um, so uh, I think that would be a good number. Can that can that snowball and and get that momentum? We'll have to see beyond New Hampshire. But you know, I like it. I'm here for it for sure. I, I like that as a threshold. Se thirty. Yeah. Shoot, but thirty percent. You're right. That that has a nice ring to it. It is undeniable. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, you know, if someone's watching this uh, before Tuesday, call your friends in New Hampshire and, and say, "Hey, check out this Dean Phillips guy. If he gets thirty percent, we might let's make we it might, interesting. We might have a non octogenarian uh, <laughs> out, out there on the trail. Fifty four. See how Talenti Gelato. Delightful. You love the <laughs> jars. You love the containers. Love it even more in the White House. Gelato for all. <laughs> Universal basic it. gelato. It's actually Perfect. better than universal basic gelato. It's like comprehensive premium. gelato reform. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's, it's premium, premium gelato for all. Um, Perfect. Well, well uh, Se, your voice of reason and wisdom always. Uh, how can people keep up with you uh, and your work? I am so sick of myself. I'm on CNN all the time now. Um, you know, because it's finally an election year, so you can see me on CNN, but you can also read my um, nationally syndicated column in the New York Daily News or papers around the country. And um, I pop up kind of everywhere. It's annoying. So you don't have to look too hard <laughs> to find me. SE is easy to find for good reason. Hopefully we'll have some things to, to celebrate. Um, <laughs> yeah, good luck. I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be rooting for you guys for sure. Well, appreciate the heck out of you. And, uh, and I'll, I'll see you on set at some point, uh, you sure, know, when, yeah. I, when I'm, when I'm uh, there, hopefully, uh, you know, like uh, bearing some good news. Yeah, I'll, I'll catch you in the green room. 